Hi, I'm John Sturman. And the question that often comes up is, well, how do we build confidence in the En-ROADS model? How do we know that it's a reasonable basis for assessing the likely impacts of policies that might reduce future global warming? One important aspect, but by far not the only one, in building confidence in any model is how well does the model replicate the historical experience of the system that you're trying to represent? In the En-ROADS climate model, we do that by comparing the historical behavior against the model for a wide range of important variables. So for example, here, you're seeing the comparison of the climate sector of the model to the historical data. Now it's important to stress that we're not using the historical data here to drive the model. The model generates the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the concentration of methane in the atmosphere, the uh, change in temperature, so the amount of global warming and sea level rise endogenously as the result of the interactions among the resources, the prices of fuels, production and use of different fuels, and how the energy system and the economy evolve. This graph in the top left shows the simulated versus actual concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from 1850 up through about now uh, in parts per million. And pre-industrial, it was about 280 parts per million. Today, it's well over 400. The most recent data put it at about uh, above 410 parts per million. You can see here the historical data coming from the Mauna Loa Observatory starting in 1958, and before that data from ice cores, uh, and the model tracks that essentially perfectly. On the top right, you see the same idea for the concentration of methane in the atmosphere, methane being an extremely powerful greenhouse gas, and again, the model tracks the historical data extremely well. In the bottom left, you see the comparison of the model in black against the two dominant time series for global average surface temperatures, one from NASA, the, global, the Goddard Institute for Space Science, and the other from the Hadley uh, Meteorological Re Climate Research uh, Group in the UK. Uh, you'll notice that the model is capturing the trend in warming extremely well from pre-industrial levels, which are treated as about zero here, to about one degree above pre-industrial, one degree C, almost two degrees Fahrenheit, above pre-industrial levels by the early 2000s. So the model captures the unmistakable trend in warming extremely well. What it doesn't do and isn't intended to do is capture the year-to-year -year fluctuations in the global average temperature. You can see that those fluctuations um, are largely reversed from year to year. Uh, also that the two data sources don't perfectly agree. They're independent of one another. They agree extremely well. And the difference between the model and the data is pretty small, even relative to the differences between those two time series. The dips and blips in the model's behavior are due to the fact that we include volcanic eruptions in the model. So for example, the uh, eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the early 1990s caused a, a temporary cooling effect, which you can clearly see in the data. And then the temperature rebounded, as you can also see in both the data and the model. Over here on the bottom right, we see sea level rise um, relative to um, about the year 2000, treated as zero. And sea level's been rising quite steadily on average around the world. And again, uh, the model picks up the trend in that extremely well uh, and isn't intended to capture the noise, the year-to-year -year fluctuations here, which are often due to measurement error. In addition, we look at how well the model captures temperature in the most recent years. So here's a graph showing from 1990 to the most recent data, which is the year 2020 approximately, uh, as I'm recording this. Uh, and again, you see the um, temperature data from Hadley and from the Goddard Institute of Space Studies with uncertainty bands around those. And then you see the behavior of the 
En-ROADS model, capturing the rather substantial trend uh, in global average service temperatures even since 1990. And here again, this is Mount Pinatubo here in the early 1990s. We also look at how well the model captures the energy systems dynamics, including the costs of the new rapidly changing renewable energy technologies like wind and photovoltaics. So here, for example, you see the marginal cost of wind power measured in dollars per megawatt hour uh, for wind power. And you can see it has declined dramatically in the historical data since 1990. And it's now down under $50 per megawatt hour. And on the right, you see the same curve for the marginal cost of solar photovoltaics uh, from 2010 on through the most recent available data. Again, a dramatic decline in the costs of solar power. In fact, the evidence is that now, 2020, 2021, as I'm recording this, uh, solar and wind are cheaper in many parts of the world than any other source of electric power, including coal, natural gas, nuclear, and all the other sources of fossil power. Uh, this is a dramatic set of developments and are rapidly speeding the adoption of wind and solar, which you see here. So on the left, you see the global capacity of wind power in the world. That's the data points uh, from uh, the International Energy Agency. And you see the behavior of the model picks up that extraordinary exponential growth essentially perfectly. Uh, the vertical scale here is exajoules per year of wind capacity. And on the right, the same graph for solar photovoltaics and even more astounding pattern of exponential growth. And again, the model picks that up essentially perfectly. 